This is Reality Dispatch, written by Jim Mintz. When her parents' house had settled and the finance was dispersed around her brothers and sisters, Camille was left with $20,000 after tax. The bike she bought sight unseen on the Facebook marketplace from a man who claimed to have owned it for less than three months. He charged her $14,000. She had sold all her possessions the day she made the online purchase. All that was left was her favorite coat, jacket, sneakers, two pairs of jeans, three pairs of underpants, and two pairs of socks. No food, no books, a dying mobile phone that wouldn't charge properly, and a picture in her wallet of her mother kissing her father. She debated internally whether or not to add this to the pile of junk to be incinerated. To hold on to the image was to be attached. She was happy to have an e-bike because it felt less confrontational than a conventional combustible engine motorcycle. They required a clutch shift and a knowledge of the braking techniques, otherwise the engine would go dead. She was reminded of a long-lost partner who was infatuated with the machines. He had an old Indian. It was intimidating to her. She remembered burning her calf muscle while sitting tandem on one particular outing. The e-bike would serve her well. It required one push to ignite, one twist of the wrist to accelerate, and one pull of the other handle to brake. It should be charged at night for optimal performance the next day. She would be able to ride five hours solidly without the need to recharge. This would serve her well. She was left with $4,500 once her possessions had emigrated out of the front door of her soon-to-be-vacated apartment. This was what liberation felt like. To stay was to be attached. She hit the open road the following day, with a sense of freedom reserved for those who had just been released from particularly long sentences. The rush of air flicking her hair, the speed and maneuverability of the machine, and the black top of the tar as it laid out beyond the horizon, all glistening under a perfect blue sky with golden sunshine. This was what heaven felt like. She would ride like this for days, for hours, for years, for however long the $4,000 would carry her. She would not rest on her laurels like she did when mom and dad were alive. To stay is to invite attachment, and she was done attaching herself to anything. Four hours had passed, and the feeling did not cease. But she was hungry. She pulled into the rest stop an hour from the border, letting her hunger dictate her moves until that beast was silenced. She only wanted to hear from the road, and she didn't welcome the intrusion. But riding required sustenance, and this could only be achieved through a refueling. She would eat, and she would leave, out the door as quickly as she came. To stay was to be attached. A burger and fries followed by a large chocolate sundae, and still she was hungry. She ordered another large fries and water for the journey. She tipped the packet down her throat as she mounted the bike and took off to be over the border by sundown. As the road trains trailed off to their towns of delivery and the cars began to dwindle out towards civilization, she rode the highway on a flat, vast horizon and watched on as destiny approached. She wondered where the road that approached led, what that road had installed for her. She found herself instantly growing fond of the image presented, the scenery, the magic that the twilight hour brings on a vast open plain. This is why people took fantastic photos at this time of the day, she thought. I should get out and take a snap for Instagram. Another thought grabbed her mind. She shook that one off. She didn't have Instagram anymore. She didn't have social media, period. Social media was a trap designed to hold her eyes hostage and steal experiences beyond the screen away from her. To be on social media was to be attached. She looked over the horizon and wondered about the house that her siblings sold. She was bitter that they never called her, never consulted, and never asked her opinion. They made a plausible case that it was not viable to hold the house in the possession of the family once mom had passed, which she could understand. But to just be rid of it, like it never existed, like it meant nothing. She was angry at herself for not fighting hard for it, not putting up a fight at least. How could they throw away their childhood like that? The four walls were where everyone laughed together, and subsequently, where everyone cried together. The house where their parents breathed their last. She was attached to that house, but she didn't realize it until it was ripped away from her. A sanctuary taken, leaving only a memory. Paradise lost, she said over the wind, but could not hear her voice. Her eyes grew weak and she felt the lids grow heavy. She had ridden for over eight hours. 
This was unsustainable for an indefinite period, and this was only day one. She needed to rest for the night and sleep. She needed uninterrupted sleep. Perhaps she would get a motel room for two days, one for the sleep and the other night for the sleep in. She found a vacant roadside establishment with an attached diner that ticked the exact box that she'd need. She checked in using the cash that filled her wallet. Her saving grace for this period of her sabbatical. The room was quaint, old but comfortable. With only three passing trucks to keep her company, she lay on her back and drifted to sleep. She was awakened by the ringing landline situated next to the bed. Hello? Hello, dear. Look, I'm sorry to disturb you. My son runs the diner next door and he's just about to turn the grill off for the night. We wondered if you'd be eating in at all? Camille took a moment to gather her thoughts and surroundings. She wasn't hungry, but she knew her body well enough that she would be the following day and she didn't plan on leaving slumber. It would serve her well to sleep on a full load. Thank you, I'll be down there in a minute, closes in 15 so you know, the reception lady said in a passive-aggressive tone as she ended the call. Camille walked into the empty diner to see the aforementioned son spot her and head over to the kitchen grills. The reception lady doubled as the diner waitress and handed her a menu. Take a seat wherever you're comfortable, honey, she said. Camille handed the menu back. I know what I'm having, a cheeseburger and fries, she said, wanting to retain the sensation she received at lunch. Familiarity was what she was seeking, a childlike familiarity. The son brought the meal over a little over 12 minutes later. He placed the plate down in front of her with a smile. Thank you, Camille said. You're welcome. Would you like something to drink? A Coke, she said instinctively. He walked back over a half minute later, with a can in one hand and a glass of ice in the other. By that time, she had already taken three bites. The burger patty melted her buds. I was not expecting this to taste this good, she said. He laughed. I'm glad. I didn't mean it in a mean way or anything. You're just very good. I cook at L'Amour, he said with a beam. Camille looked on with a vague expression. You're from Sydney, right? Yeah, yeah. Never heard of L'Amour? No, it's Michelin star. I'm not a foodie. Right, he said. That makes sense. He looked down at the meal he had prepared. Hey, you made it, she laughed. He laughed too. She liked him. He was handsome. Why are you cooking here? If you are a great big wig chef? I grew up here. I visit my parents on the weekends. He took a seat opposite without asking. Camille tensed up. Is something wrong? No, she lied. Hey, if you're not comfortable, I'll go, he said, standing. Yes, please. Could you? She asked. No problem. He had left as quickly as he had arrived. She was saddened to see him leave, despite her visual discomfort. But to stay is to be attached. She stood from the table and paid for her meal to his mother, who turned her curious gaze of her into scorn. She left the motel on the back of the bike and continued her aimless travels. The heavens opened up and the rain began to pour down on the midnight roads. It was the polar opposite of her experiences on the open road ten hours earlier. She wanted that feeling of freedom and openness to return. She slowed her speed, but the cars that had suddenly appeared on the blacktop did not. She was vulnerable. She wondered if she should turn back to the motel, now that she had been riding for 25 minutes. It would take her that long to return. She yearned to put her head down on that brown corduroy pillow. She missed the fabrics and the fake tiled walls already. She was attached to that room in the 30 minutes she had spent in there. To stay is to be attached, she reminded herself. She twisted her right wrist and accelerated on through the storm, into the morning, into the unknown. For more stories of fact-based fiction, head to jimmins.substack.com.